good morning. Man, it's so good to see all of you for week two of a series that we're calling Death and All His Friends. All of us face it at one time or another in our lives, or even personally, we're going to. Everybody dies. But how do we really healthfully face death and, and make it through to not just be stuck? Last week, we read a scripture in Job chapter 1 that I want to read again. Job chapter 1, verse 21 Here's Job's response after losing everything. He says, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Now that is an unbelievable response to loss. And we'll find out more in Job, or you find out more in Job that that was not the only response. There was anger, there was confusion, there were questions, there were all these 38 chapters or 39 chapters full of Job pouring his heart out, grieving and mourning and wondering why and all those things. Well, today, one of my dear friends is going to tell his story, and it is a story of loss but it is also a story of healing, and I want you to open your hearts for what God would want to say to you in your situation. We can't compare our situations. Every situation matters to God, I promise you. But this one is one that most of us in this room will never face. And I pray that you would open your hearts, and we're going to talk with Mike in just a minute. Mike Martin and Penny, his wife, are on our team here at Hope, or so I'm so honored to work with them. Um, but they are going to tell their story, and Mike especially going to tell his story, and I want you to open your heart for what he has to say to you. I want you to watch this, and we'll come back and talk. When I met Lisa, it was on a volleyball court in college. It was, it was really easy to see that I wanted to talk to her. Um, she was fun-loving, pretty, outgoing, uh, bubbly personality. We dated for two years, and then got married. Lisa was a first grade teacher. Like any marriage, me and Lisa's marriage was, was difficult at times. Most of the time, I was the one to blame for the difficulty. Through all of the difficulties, I can say that the last year of our marriage was by far the best year of our marriage. We had three boys. Chance was our oldest. Chance was high energy, Fun-loving, high motor, little sleep. Brock, he was our middle child. He was dark-headed, blue-eyed, big, strong, quiet. Reed, Reed was our young one. And we figured with an oldest brother like Chance and Brock, he was going to, he was going to need to be big, long, strong, and tough. On September 20th, 2004, my life would change forever. That day started not unlike any other day would start. We were remodeling a house in a small town outside of Sherman, Texas. The reason that day was special, it was the first day that my entire family, including the newborn, Reed, which was about seven weeks old at the time, was in the house. Chance and Brock had on little work gloves that I bought from Home Depot, and they were going around the house, picking up trash, throwing it in a trash can. Lisa was showing her mom all the changes on the house, and I was holding Reed. They stayed about an hour, and after that time was up, they were gonna go to Sherman to purchase bikes for Christmas. After Lisa and the kids left to go look at bikes, I continued to work on the house, waiting for my brother-in-law and a friend to come help us. Jay was late as usual, which, was <laughs> which is not uncommon. To this day, Jay is still late. As he came in the house, I, I asked Jay, oh, hey, why are you late? He said, well, there was a wreck on Highway 75, and the road was completely shut down. I registered that, but didn't think about it at the time. I just continued to rag on Jay for being late. 
We decided that instead of working for an hour and stopping to eat, that we would rather eat an early dinner and work straight through the evening. As me and Jay got in the truck to a restaurant, to go to a restaurant, all of a sudden, a feeling came over me like Lisa was involved. I looked at Jay and said, you're gonna laugh at me tomorrow and you're probably gonna think I'm crazy, but somehow I think Lisa and the kids are involved. We kept driving to the restaurant. After we met Butch at the restaurant, I'm literally gonna walk in the door, my hands on the door of the restaurant, and I look at Jay and I say, hey, this I know this sounds crazy, I'm gonna go ahead and go into Sherman. Why don't you and Butch eat, and Butch can give you a ride home. As I turned around to drive from Sherman, the first call I made was to the Sherman Police Department. I said, I heard there was a wreck on 75, and this probably sounds like, <laughs> I'm sure this sounds crazy, but I just wanted to see if my car was involved. So I told the dispatch officer, we drove a, my wife drove a blue expedition. Um, there were my wife, my mother-in-law Betsy, and Chance Brock and Reed in the car. The dispatcher had a long pause. And the dispatcher told me, I can't confirm that your wife was involved in the accident, but I, can I get your number to call you back if we have any information? Immediately I thought that they were involved. I asked the dispatcher, do you think I should go to the accident site? The dispatcher said, I can't tell you what to do, but if you went to the accident site, I would understand. When I got to the scene, it was almost dark. They had big bright lights to light up the accident site. Multiple fire trucks, multiple police cars, multiple officers. I drove to the shoulder. I got out of my pickup and I looked across the road and I said, I think that's my car. An officer came to me and said, how do you think this is your family? I said, I, sir, I don't know. They showed me a license plate and they said, sir, is this license plate yours? It wasn't. They showed me another license plate and said, is this license plate yours? I said, yes, that's the license plate on my wife's car. The reason that they could not call me or call anybody is they didn't know which license plate went to which vehicle. The, the violence of the wreck knocked the license plate off the vehicles. When I looked over at what was left of our car, they were in the process of cutting Lisa, my wife, out of the car. I saw paramedics crying. I saw paramedics throwing up. I saw blood all over the highway. I will never forget the smell of burned diesel fuel, rubber, and flesh. I remember asking, did everybody die? And the officer said, no. He said the truck driver had a few broken teeth, but other than that, he's okay. I remember sitting down and saying, isn't that the way it always is? The drunk driver or the impaired driver is never hurt. I don't know how long I sat there. It could have been five minutes, it could have been 30. We were living with my mother and father-in-law while our house was being remodeled. By the time we got to, by the time I got to the house, 
family was there, friends were there, um, pastors from church were there. My brother, his father-in-law is a surgeon and they had come and he prescribed a pill for me to get some sleep. I took the pill and went back to the room where Lisa and I had slept the night before. And I got in the bed. And I can tell you without a doubt, in no uncertain terms, in the most clear way possible, that when I laid on the bed, I wanted to die. I told my brother I wanted to die. I laid in the bed and I remember thinking, my entire life is gone. People in a room are praying. My brother looks at me and he said, just pray something. As the medication took effect, I can hear the murmurs of prayer. My brother's standing right over the top of me and he just says, pray, just pray something. And I prayed the most powerful prayer I've ever prayed in my life. And all I prayed over and over was help me, help me, help me until I went to sleep. Mike, I've heard that now five or six times and I still, still emotions rise and I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine that. You, you, you go to bed that night knowing that your whole life has changed. You go to bed wanting to die. What happens the next morning? I woke up ready to fight. I woke up ready to, uh, to battle what I had to battle. Um, After praying those prayers, th those few words, yeah. help me, you felt different that next morning. There, there is no doubt. I was, I was in a house full of friends and family, yeah. praying people, and there's no doubt that the prayers of not only the people in that room, but everybody praying for us, that, that, that God worked on me that night. And, and uh, I went from wanting to die to ready to see what I had to do to try to make it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, over the years now, you've talked to many, many groups of people Grief classes here at Hope, you've done that, and I'm sure other places you've helped friends of mine who have gone through devastating loss. Um, there's five things that you typically have learned through your process. Um, talk to us about those five things. If you have journey guide out, I mean, you may think you don't need it right now, but I'm going to promise you, the, all of these, no matter what season of life you're in, it may not be a loss like this. But there might be something in your life, a, a divorce, a, a loss of some other kind, business or whatever, that you're just going to need. There's some grieving. There's some pain. I want you to learn from this. First one you talk about, though, is timelines of the grieving process. Talk to us about the timelines. The timelines are, well, there are three that I want to talk about. You have your time where you mourn. Uh, you have the grieving time. And then you have the time where... We're going to call it living time. You'll hear that in other ways, uh, moving forward, moving on. Um, ironically, this is one of the places I made my mistake. Um, I didn't mourn enough. Hmm. And, and my opinion would be that as, as men, we don't mourn. We say, you know what, we're going to be strong and tough, and we're going to, we're going to get through it. And for me, I think my not mourning just taking that time and just mourning and just totally yeah. giving in the emotions, it, it bled into some of the time and it took me longer to grieve. Wow. Other people, they get stuck 
in that morning spot. They get stuck right there, and their life stops right there at that morning time. Um, the thing about timelines, they're different for different people. Yeah. Um, and and, and this, is, this is a critical part of it, and, and I'm going to give an example, and I, 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 I know that there will be people in the room when I give this example that have been affected by this. If parents lose a child, t- the timelines can be different. And, and I don't want to use the word that, that parents have to compromise because it's not a compromise. Um, and when I say timelines and difference, those are, very, those are very general terms. What am I talking about? Well, in the timeline, how are you going to do those first times? Yeah. How are you going to do the birthdays? Yeah. How are you going to do Christmas, Thanksgiving? How are you going to do the day they passed away? One parent might say, you know what? On their birthday, I want to be happy. I want to remember the good things. I want to tell stories. Yeah. I want it to be fun. The other parent might say, I can't do that. That is too emotionally raw for me. I'm going to go, and I'm going to get through my day, and I'm going to go in my own way. Which way is right? Which way is wrong? There's not one. Yeah. There's not one. And so there's not a compromise there, but you have to talk and you have to be able to work together and go, this is how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to do it. We're different people. We're wired differently. It can't be a right or wrong. Mm. It, it can't be, well, I'm doing it this way and so I'm moving faster. Maybe you didn't love them like I loved them. Or, you know, I'm trying to move on and you just are stuck in this spot. You can't get there. You have to talk and work yeah, together. Yeah, that's good. So. Talk to me about that getting stuck. You you mentioned that you know guys normally we're just gonna move on. We're gonna, you know, you're gonna hit the weights or you're gonna hit the job and you're gonna just make it busy and do it all that and you don't mourn. But then some get stuck. Talk to me about that. I call that the T in the road. And for anybody who's been, you know, you've driven down the road and there's a T, you've got two directions. You can go this way. You can go this way. And the T in the road is very simple. And it happens in that spot between mourning and grieving Mm -hmm. when you're starting to move forward. The T in the road is when you decide, am I going to be the victim or am I going to try to move through and grieve and live? That's so powerful right there because we all have that decision, right? Especially in something like this. You can stay there mm -hmm. or you can decide to move on. And the, the easy thing about staying there is... Man, you've got a bunch of excuses that nobody will touch, right? Yeah. Because if you know, if you want to be the victim, you can say, "Well, I'm not. I I'm. I'm not coming into work today. You know, after going through what I went through, I, I just can't do it. Who's going to touch that? Yeah. Or, you know, name the excuse. But to get through it and not be stuck right there in that mourning period when you become known as the person who lost yeah. whatever. Yeah. You have to move through there. That's a T in the road. That's a place where you have to decide, I don't want to go that way. I want to go this way. Yeah. And that's, that's got to be tremendously difficult. It's, it's, it's a decision. It's that, a discipline. It, it's a decision that you'll make more than one time. Yeah, and it's a, it's a decision that you have to say, how, how am I going to deal with this situation? Am I going to go left? Yeah. Am, I going to, yeah. am, am I going to get out the patented excuse and throw it out? Or am I going to suck it up and try to go right yeah. and, and live? But, you, you, you know, talk about the emotions, though. The third thing that you kind of deal with is the emotions, because the emotions, you know, probably really raw at the beginning, but, but you still have them. I mean, I, they don't end, so how do you deal with the emotions? The emotions never go away. Um, the birthdays, the holidays, they never go away. So you have to learn how to, uh, how to deal with them. Um, you got to fake it. You got to fake it till you make it. You got to say, you what gotta do you say mean by that? Well, some people in the room might say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm not fake, and I'm definitely not going to come to church and be fake, and I'm, I'm plain spoken, and I say what I mean and mean what I say, and, you know, you get out of my mouth, you get what you get. Well, give you an example. I don't know if anybody's done this here. Probably not at hope. Probably not at hope. Other, other places, probably not at hope. So let's throw out a scenario. So you're driving to church with your spouse or your kids are in a car, and you start to argue. And 
So you have that argument, and it, it could be a big argument. It could be a small argument. It could be about money in the checking account, or it could be about the raisin cinnamon bagels that you really wanted plain. We are, well, no, we don't all know. Sorry. Let me back up. <laughs> um, so you're having this argument. So you drive to church, fussing, discussing, whole time, get out, close the door, and then ironically, you walk in and you see Pastor John or one of the pastors or a teacher and you go, what do you do immediately? Hey, how's it going? What's going on? Blessed to be here. How about them cowboys? You looking good. So we fake it, right? We all fake it. Other people, not us. I'll say me. But anyway, so you fake it. It's a learned response. So, but but how, did, how, does that, how did that help you in, in this faking? Because that sounds, as some of us like, whoa, I can never do that. But we really do in, in a lot of ways. But how did that help you to, to, what do you call it, trick your emotions? So we're talking about being the victim. One thing about being the victim is the person that's a victim, and this is not just with, with, uh, with death. This can be... A victim can be a person uh, that's been divorced. And mm -hmm. the victim would say, well, you know, my life hadn't been the same. I got divorced 23 years ago, and life just hadn't been the same. That's Those, when you know oh, somebody's stuck. They're stuck. And wow. so that victim, most of the time, the victim mentality, the victim person, they're not the funnest to be around. They're yeah. not positive. So faking your emotions when you realize that you have the ability to walk in a room and totally destroy the room yep. with an action, say, well, you know, hey, I'm having a hard day with my boss. Well, that's funny because, you know, all my wife and kids died. You can destroy, right? Boom, boom, done. Who's topping that one? Well, that's a victim mentality. So for me, faking the emotions, yeah. I did not want to be that person. I didn't want to walk into a room yeah. And have people go, oh, that's that Mike's guy. Mike's here. That's that guy. And, you know, I feel so sorry for him. And he's kind of, you know, he's kind of gruff and crabby. and. But mean. he has reason to be. But, you know, here's what he went through. Because, to be honest with you, if I'm going to be gruff and crabby, I want to be gruff and crabby because I'm gruff and crabby, not because I'm a victim. Mm -hmm. I want to be me. I don't want to be, I don't want anybody to ever say, oh, well, look yeah. at this that he got dealt. Right. So you have to fake it till you make it. Um, Another key thing for me, just getting outside of myself, looking around. I would end up at the mall walking just because I went from a house full of people to being alone. So I'd walk around the mall and I'd look around and I'd be like, oh man, that, that could be bad to you know, have a, you know, a, a, a physical problem where I couldn't run or walk or boy, that would be hard to have a special needs child and that must take it a lot of emotional energy. So I kind of started getting outside of myself. Wow. And that was good for me because there's a time when you're going through this process where you have to be selfish. Yes. You have to look in and be honest with yourself and go, I have to improve here. I'm not good here. But when you're looking inside and you keep looking and it's me, 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 and yeah. I, 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 then you get focused on me, 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 and I. And so you got to get outside of yourself. Wow. So those emotions, it, it's, I would love to tell you that, that I can do it well. I still battle with it. Yeah. Um, it's... Uh, it's a constant, it's a constant work. Yeah. So then you, you move into this, this idea of sounding boards, having someone or, or a, a, a small group of people to talk to in these times, because it's all raw, it's all real, and you've got to protect that. Yes. How, talk to us about sounding boards. <clears throat> this, is a, this is another place where I made a mistake. Um, I found out that you can't use friends and you can't use family members. And I know for some of you that sounds pretty, uh, pretty crazy because you say, well, you don't understand my family. We're super close. Yeah. We're super tight. We're probably the closest you know, family in Texas, maybe North America. We're close. You don't understand. We can talk about anything. Well, here's what happened in our family. If I was having a particularly bad day and I called a family member who might have been having a good day, Immediately what happened when I said, hey, I'm just, oh, I'm just missing them. And I'm, I have taken them from a decent emotional place and I've pulled them down yeah. with me in my emotional ditch. Yeah. So then you call the next family member. So what happens, and you're all well-meaning. Everybody, yeah. you're tight, you're close, you want to help each other. But basically what happens is everybody takes their emotions and from the family and they're trying to do well. 
But then the whole family stays in this yeah. just chaotic, down, Can't emotional get out of state. It. Can't get out yeah. of it. So, so who'd you talk to? I had a pastor who basically just, for six months, he just gave me all of his time. Um, I had friends that, uh, from life group that over years of just getting to know each other, we became close. They ate breakfast with me every Tuesday morning for a year wow. or more. Wow. Um, talked to counselors. But, but the thing about having a soundboard, you have to pick carefully. Um, and a question is, okay, I'm going through this grieving process. I'm not really in much of a mental state to pick a soundboard. How am I going to pick a soundboard? Here's what I would say. You pick someone that acts, talks, and lives like you want to live. That's so good. You pick someone, because with those three, you've kind of got your bases covered. Say, um, say that again. Just, you pick someone who acts, talks, and lives like you want to live. And wow. the thing you have to tell your soundboard, you have to say, you know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Because with your family, we've already talked about, you can't just keep sharing just that devastating pain because you're going to pull your family into it. So you have to tell your soundboard, man, you got to be tough enough to listen to some stuff. I'm, right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be angry. I'm going to be hurt. And, yeah. and your soundboard has to be tough enough to... To, to do that. Now, I just want to flip it for a second. Let's say you are a soundboard. Let's say somebody has come to you and said, hey, I'm going through this. I really yeah. value you and I want you to, to help me through this. If you are a soundboard, do not write a check that you can't cash. I and, love this. You and, said this last night, but I, I want you to dive into that just a minute. What do you mean? Well, Soundboards, they want to help. They want, their, I yeah. mean, they want to help, but there are things they can't do because because people, we have lives. We have jobs, kids, yeah. activities. So not writing a check that you can't cash means this. <laughs> hey, man, you call me anytime, day or night. I'm there, no problem. Give me the word. Here's my cell number. Yeah. There's no doubt that a soundboard means that. But life gets in the way. Yeah. Soundboard's got to go to work. Soundboard's got kids. Five-year-old soccer game. He's got got the kids while the wife does bridge night. Soundboard's got life. Bridge. So it. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Pinochle. There you go. <laughs> I haven't heard bridge since I was a kid. Though. Yeah. I but always, something. Always got to zing me. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I appreciate you. But, so, but they've got to be willing. Yes. To but but they also have to be. Um, uh, real yes. about their boundaries. You have to be, if, you, if somebody's picking you to be a soundboard, say, I want to help you. Here's what I can do. Yeah. And you got to be honest. You got to be honest. Um, that's, those people that were my soundboards, I talked to them some regularly. I, talk, I, I haven't talked to one in a while. I can tell you, those folks, I owe them Yeah the quality of everything I have. And if somebody chooses you to be a soundboard, you're going to have an effect on somebody that you can't imagine. Wow. And, and take it very seriously. Yeah, that's good. Last thing that you, that you deal with is uh, or are the why questions. You, there's no way you can walk through this and not... We all have them. Sit we, there and say why. We have why questions about everything. How do you deal with that? Or how do you deal with that? The why questions, when, when I realized that the why questions were never going to be answered, they were not going to stop coming. Yeah. And when do the why questions come? The why questions, most of the time, they come at night. They come at night because kids are asleep, TV's off, you're laying in the bed, and your brain's just thinking. Yep. So you got those why questions. They never go away. Well, what do you do with the why questions? <clears throat> a guy told me a phrase. You got to put it on the shelf. So you take these why questions, put them in a box, mm -hmm. and you put them on a shelf. You don't deal with them. You're not going to answer them. 
Yep. Nobody can tell you the secret to unlocking them. Right. Those are the questions that this side of heaven will not be answered. So you put them up. How do you put them up? You have to get your mind off of them. For me, um, I'm a coach's kid. Dad's a retired basketball coach. So we grew up playing everything, playing sports. Sports is an outlet for me. Um, ESPN's a wonderful thing for me. So in the middle of the night, you know, I flip to ESPN 7 and watch Montana Tech play Oregon State in, you know, in competitive badminton, and I'm okay. <laughs> you know, I'm good. Life is good. Um, you just, you got to do something that takes your mind away. Yeah. Takes your mind away. Now, it, it might not just be sports or TV. Um, one of the best things that, that uh, somebody told me early on was, you know, when you're struggling at night and you're going through those why questions, read a psalm. Yeah. Open up the Bible. Just read a psalm. The word is, is calming, is strengthening. And I got to be honest with you, I um, hate to say this right next to my pastor. I was pretty cynical. I was like, really? I've read the Bible a while. I mean, it's going to comfort me. Open up those psalms, start reading. Next thing you know, I mean, yeah. there is There's power yeah, in the absolutely. word of God. It's, it's, so watch sports. Read a psalm. Um, it might be listening to worship music. It might be praying. Find a way. Find a way on those why questions to box them up, put them on a shelf. Yeah, because I don't have the answer. You know, and that's what a lot of us want to, in the church especially as a pastor, you want to be able to answer that for somebody because you want to try to uh, protect God. I know for me, I, mean, I want to try to protect him from the... the the, the atheist or protect him from those who are going through hard times. Like, well, if, there, if you allowed this to happen, how could he be good? And why? The, you know, the same, so I want to answer those questions so I can protect God. Can I just tell you that God can take care of himself? God can take care of himself, and in Job, he does. So the why questions, you're so right, and it sounds counterintuitive because we want to just get those questions answered. Why did they do this? Why did my family member do this? And all the why, why didn't I do this? Mm -hmm. Why didn't I go here? Mm -hmm. what, what, all those things. I love that, man. I think it's really helpful for us to, to just pack them away and say, you know what, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. Yes. And I'm just going to put that in you. I'm going to box it up, and I'm going to give it to you. Yes. Mike, thank you for your heart to even be willing, and Penny as well. Uh, those of you who don't know Penny, I want you to show a picture of Penny, Cade, and Ty <laughs> on the screen. God has given Mike a beautiful family. I've known Penny for years, a godly woman who loves God with all of her heart, and uh, on our team, both of these guys are on our team. We're just so blessed. I am so blessed to work with these guys. Mike, you have some family here too as well, won't you? I, I do. Really, them? really quick. I don't want you to stand up. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just want you to do the, uh, you know, the beauty pageant wave. Um, Lisa's sister Laura, her daughter Kaylee, son oh. Jay. This is Jason, my late partner that I called you out on video. Sorry. Um, Jason's mom and dad, and Jason's aunts. Wow. So, I want to tell you guys something. When I talk about doing it right, I watched these people. Landry, I left you out, buddy. I'm sorry. And Landry, raise your hand real high. When, when I talk about how people did it right, I watched these people. I watched these people rely on God and, and, and work through some tough things. I watched these guys live out all these principles. Yeah. And I just, to, I just want to tell you, I, I'm so happy you're here. Um, I'm so happy that we're all healthy and we're all living. And mm -hmm. thanks for being here. And they're all loving too. Yes. That's, yeah. Well, here, <clears throat> here at Hope, we have a grief recovery class. Uh, if you've been going through stuff, you know, loss, especially um, that's happening in our next semester of our uh, grow classes on Tuesday and Thursday nights here at the Frisco campus and, and soon to be McKinney. Um, as well, uh, Michelle Modesto, who lost her husband, uh, has started a ministry called Widows Helping Widows. It's going to be on the screen widowshelpingwidows.org 
is a great ministry to help support one another. We want to provide everything that we can to help you, like Mike was able to do. Only God can do this. I truly believe this. Only God can do this, help you get to that T and turn the right direction. No doubt. And we want to help you do that. Mike, thank you again. Penny, thank you. I love you, and thank you for allowing this to all happen. Can, we, can I pray for you guys? Oh, definitely. Let's do that. Would you, would you join me in prayer as we pray for Mike and Penny and the whole family? Guys, thank you all for being here. It means a lot, I know, to Mike, but it also means a lot to us that you would take the time to come, and we love you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Mike and, and all that he has allowed you to do in him because he wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to work through him unless he allowed you to work in him. And he chose to go the right direction at that T. And I pray blessing on he and his family. I pray that in every way, whatever you have in store for them in the days to come, whatever ministry, whatever doors open, whatever you have, we bless them and we ask that you would provide, that you would guide, that you would Bless them beyond their wildest dreams. I pray for Cade and Ty. Bless them, Lord. Give this family all that they need to be all that you've called them to be in their lives, in their family, in their ministry. I pray this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I love you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thank man. You. One more hand.